Well, welcome. I, uh, I'm delighted to see you here, frankly. I mean, uh, you know, when, when we in the re you know, reunion committee started thinking about doing a program of our own for this uh, reunion, uh, we really didn't know what would, you know, what would be of interest um, and what would be of, of substance because we all know that you can have a very good time at a reunion like this, but the idea was to make it a little more than that. Uh, before we really start the program, there are a couple of things I want, to, uh, I want to do. One is to introduce Jack Ware. Jack, where are you? Are you here? Is Jack Ware here? I was told he would be. No? Well, Jack Ware is the uh, 19, he's, he's the class of 1968 scholarship winner. Uh, he's the one who has the Our Class Scholarship, which I think you all know is something that we have funded over time. And I'm sorry he's not here, but uh, you know, this is Washington and Lee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also want to say a special thanks uh, to Mary Webster, who has really been instrumental. Uh, the whole staff, the WNL staff has been fantastic in the whole process of putting something like this together. But she has been absolutely wonderful uh, in, in doing all the kinds of things that are required uh, to make a thing like this happen, uh, which required a great deal of busy work and difficult kind of collating and she's creating a little booklet uh, from the people's responses to our invitation to talk about advice for the class of 2018 and that's going to be given to them, all the graduates of 2018, uh, uh, as part of their package when they graduate, not with the diploma, but it's <laughs> going to be given to them as a gift from us and from Washington and Lee, which I thought was a lovely thing to, uh, to do. Uh, well, let's get going. You know, I, th I think that uh, yesterday when I arrived here on that beautiful, beautiful day we had yesterday, um, at least we have had one very beautiful day, I think, without question. Um, if you went to the alumni house, you might have gone looking at the uh, window with the, at the photographs on the wall. And there was one that especially struck me, which was of freshman camp in the 1950s. And it looked just exactly like freshman camp in 1964, when we all were there. Uh, Washington and Lee, really, when we came to Washington and Lee, had not changed for quite a while. It was of a, a, a time and a period uh, that was poised for change, but really, in many respects, had not. I don't mean to say that it was uh, a, a place that was not uh, demanding. I don't mean that it was like a place that was not a serious place for scholarship. Uh, for instance, I think many of you who were there will recall we were sitting in the audience area under a tent at, summer camp, at the freshman camp and whoever was speaking said, look to your left, look to your right. When you finish, one of you will be gone. One of those people will be gone. And sure enough, about a third of the people who came and matriculated in 1964 in September did not graduate for a variety of reasons. But that was, the point was that this was this was a winnowing process that Washington and Lee put in place through something you may recall called the automatic rule, and largely, which meant that if you fell below a certain grade point average, you went on probation, and if you didn't get it up, then you were out. Now, you could reapply, but you weren't assured of that. But when I looked at that photograph, I also realized again just how homogeneous Washington and Lee was. We were a group of white, middle class, upper middle class males. There was, if there were any African Americans in the school at that time, I was really not aware of it. Uh, there were half a dozen women's schools within an hour's drive or so, but, but there were no women in classes. We were basically a group of white, southern, not altogether Southern, but the cast of the school was Southern. It had traditions like the speaking tradition and the, and the dress code and, uh, and of course the honor code that were a part of a world that uh, has over time been eroded. But at those days in 1964, 
uh, was still very powerful, I think, especially the honor code, which is endured as a part of the culture of Washington and Lee. And, well, you know, yesterday as I was walking along around the campus, I remembered a moment in my junior year when I was walking up from Red Square toward the colonnade. It was on a day just like yesterday, beautiful, gorgeous day, and I remember thinking, literally having it shockingly come to me, in another year they're going to make me leave. <laughs> and I wasn't, it wasn't about Vietnam, because at that time there was the expectation that if you passed a test of some kind, you could get a deferment to go to graduate school. But, as we all know, years went by. I mean, when we came here, Jack Kennedy had been assassinated less than a year before. We were not unaware of the world, but we lived in a rather, you know, special kind of place. And it was a special kind of place that most of us really loved and thrived on. But it was not the world. Uh, the world came crashing through in 1968 in the form especially of Vietnam. Uh, if you recall, the Tet Offensive was in January of 68. Uh, not long after, Walter Cronkite, who was at that time the sort of the, the arbiter of, of all journalistic truth, declared that the war was unwinnable. It was stranded in a, in a stalemate mire. And then in February of 1968, the Johnson administration abolished all deferments. Abolished all deferments for people who were graduating from college and intended to go to grad school. The only exceptions were dental school and med school, and then you had to do your service after, or divinity school. And I think we had a, a rather unusual number of divinity school graduates. <laughs> as we, you know. But the point was, Washington and Lee wasn't what I would call a place that really had very much of an anti-war sentiment. What it did have, though, in 1968, was a huge amount of anxiety about what came next. Was it going to be the draft? Was it going to be Canada? Was it going to be Sweden? Was it going to be jail? Uh, was it going to be some other solution? Because we were all facing it. There were no deferments. That was over. So, with that, I would like to begin our conversation about 1968 uh, with John Adams. John, you wrote that you were thinking, at, you know, at those days about going to Canada, about going to Sweden possibly. Uh, you were ended up a, a, a year later flying combat missions over Vietnam. So, tell us what was going on in 1968 with John Adams. Well, I didn't have a very good plan, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't work out the way I'd figured it. Uh, I didn't have a strongly held uh, beliefs either for or against the war. Uh, I was largely uh, floatsam. Uh, I didn't have particular ambitions in life or goals when I graduated. Um, I thought probably I'd, I'd do some uh, uh, graduate work someplace in some field, but I wasn't even really, uh, hadn't even selected a field to look into. And then my draft uh, notice came, my draft physical. I was very successful with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, three weeks after I graduated from WNL, um, I was in uh, uh, officer training school in the Air Force. That was my way of uh, uh, getting out of the, the draft and uh, being a, the lowest rung of the ladder in the U.S. Army, probably with destination Vietnam. So my Vietnam draft, uh, my Vietnam dodge was to go in the Air Force, spend a year at least uh, flying, learning to fly airplanes, and um, maybe things would cool off a little bit over in Southeast Asia in that time frame. 
Um, did you ever think, sir, you wrote about how you thought about going to Canada and you thought about a girlfriend of yours wanted you to go to Sweden. How serious was that? I assigned no greater priority to it than I did any other particular <laughs> thing. So the thing is, I suspect you were like I was saying, it was not so much anti war, it was not, at all. not wanting to get killed for a war that apparently Walter Cronkite said couldn't be won anymore. So it changed one's perspective on what one wanted, yeah. what one wanted to do. At the same time, you ended up going. I did. <coughs> and uh, uh, one year after uh, uh, I joined the Air Force, I was in Vietnam in Da Nang. Dudley, Dudley Cock was my roommate. And so I went through this period with him. And we went different directions. I ended up in the Navy. Dudley became a conscientious objector through great difficulty and after a great deal of thought. But it was not thought about whether he would go or not, I don't think. Dudley, where, where did your perspective on this come from? So, um, <clears throat> If, if uh, the world came crashing in in 1968, maybe that's a little hyperbole, but um, for me, it was uh, 1963. I had just finished the 11th grade in high school, and on June 12th, Medgar Evers was assassinated. Now, uh, <clears throat> I was very surprised at how this affected me because I had not been uh, that involved in politics and I'd grown up with a lot of history with a lot of debate uh, about the Civil War and had relatives on both sides of, uh, of that tragedy so I was immersed in a kind of long history of the US that actually stretched back uh, to Jamestown. So this was all a part of just who I was um, as a high school kid. But when Evers was uh, assassinated, I just felt uh, viscerally, it wasn't an idea, it wasn't something that I had, was philosophizing about, but I just felt a kind of hope beginning to drain out of uh, the country. That was the visceral reaction. Now, if you all know much about Medgar Evers, he had uh, fought the uh, Battle of Normandy. He was a sergeant, World War II uh, veteran. So it just really affected me and in a way that was unexpected. And so at that time, I made a commitment as a seven, just 17 years old, I just turned 17, to the Civil Rights Movement. So you can imagine with that kind of um, commitment and that kind of lens on, I arrive at Washington and Lee. So that was, so I was already um, looking, if you will, from a sort of different uh, perspective. So I saw everything a little uh, differently maybe than Alex did and some of the other uh, classmates. So that commitment um, continued. I mean, it just increased, increased, increased. I'm still, uh, still part of the civil rights movement in my work today. But as you all know, uh, the civil rights movement uh, morphed right into the anti-war movement, and uh, you know, chiefly singled in 1967 at Riverside Church when Martin Luther King made that powerful address that basically called up Eisenhower's military industrial political complex and united the civil rights movement with the poor people's uh, march on Washington and uh, with uh, the anti-war movement. You know, his claim was this is all one and this is the struggle. Now I was right there with that and in fact, in the movement itself, which was really grassroots, some people said King had to spend a lot of time trying to catch up to the way the people were moving. And so we had quite a, a, a bit of this uh, thought long before he articulated it in that uh, uh, you know, rememberable way he, he always had. Tom, you were, unlike the other three panelists, 
uh, not in a fraternity, but you were, of course, just as much affected by this. And I don't know whether you're not being a fraternity had anything to do with how you experienced 1968, but how would you describe your own experience? I, I, I don't think it, um, it had the experience. It was really very similar to, to what um, we have just heard and, and what we've read about. Um, you know, and I had really forgotten about uh, the doing away with deferments in February. I just, when I think back to that period, I just remember coming back after Christmas or New Year's, um, final semester, looking, you know, forward to graduating. But then all of a sudden, my mind just goes to, uh, you know, my whole time was spent, what am I going to do? You know, am I going to be drafted? How can I get out of this? Um, I remember uh, being in various, um, apartments looking at Walter Cronkite on the news, the bombing, it, um, you know, my, I mean, we, and we would alternate laughing and sort of almost crying, you know, it, I mean, God, this is where, are we going to be there in six months or nine months? Um, it, it really was, um, it was sort it was over, over, overwhelming. I mean, that was, that was the whole, our raison d'etre almost. It I, was. I, I remember going back, um, I was from Wilmington, Delaware, I remember going back and uh, I, um, you know, do, do I look for a job, what do I do, am I going to be drafted, um, I, um, I, um, I, I got sort of, I, they knew I, I had the possibility of being drafted, but I, I went to work for a local brokerage firm, um, and then, you know, I was drafted in October, November, and, and then, um, by May, May of the next year, May 31st, I was in Vietnam as a, a motor pool clerk, so. I was that, that year, uh, I was at Phi Delta Theta and I had usually had dinner at the Phi Delta Theta house. And after dinner, I would go down to the basement and watch the CBS Evening News. Mm -hmm. uh, and the person I usually watched it with was Barry Crosby. Mm -hmm. As some of you may know, Barry Crosby was killed in mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam. And I remember sitting there with him watching this night after night. Uh, and both of us, you know, frantically trying to figure out what we were going to do. At least I was frantically trying to figure out what I was going to do. But Barry, for reasons I still to this day don't understand, um, was completely passive about it. He refused to do anything. And I was very frustrated with him because I <laughs> sort of had a sense that this was, you know, something that you at least needed to be proactive about. Like, John, you went to, you visited every one of the services before you chose the Air Force, didn't you? I mean, you went to recruiters all up and down the line? Every little town in America has a <laughs> string of... <laughs> well, I was in the Gulf of Tonkin on a ship uh, when I got word that Barry had been killed. And uh, hmm. it was, a, you know, it was a terrible, terrible blow because I literally had been you know, pleading with it to do something, something, anyway. But uh, there was a kind of malaise about that issue for some people, I think. And just as, as for some people, it was a very clear-cut decision, and there was a feeling that they wanted to uh, go and do their duty and, and honor their parents. My father had been <laughs> in World War II and so forth. And when it came to my choice, I knew that I was not going to go to Canada and I wasn't going to go to jail. And I was going, though, at the same time to try to do my duty but not get killed. And I couldn't persuade Barry to think that way. Now, you know, the thing is, it was a kind of a cocoon we lived in after a fashion. And I think that there's been a kind of sort of image of Washington and Lee as a kind of a uh, place that the, the 60s missed, uh, that there was not a lot of uh, the summer of love and there was not a lot of, of uh, you know, of, of that kind of thinking around. But there was, there really was a streak of anarchy at <laughs> Washington and Lee. And one of the best examples of that, I want with the lines to offer to you this morning <laughs> because it is one of my favorite stories about Washington and Lee uh, at that at that time. Wit, please. Is this being streamed? If so, <laughs> we'll turn that down. Uh, there, there was a sense of both mischief and anarchy, and, but it was more in line, at least in some of my fraternity experiences, 
uh, with Animal House, and, and there's <laughs> one specific episode that... Can you all hear? Uh, there's one specific event that really uh, brought that home. It was Spring's weekend, and if you recall, they still had Saturday classes, not just Saturday classes, but <laughs> 8 o'clock, or 8.30 Saturday <laughs> classes. Uh, well, Dave Holbert had bought these big KLH speakers, and it was a beautiful spring day. Oh. He had opened the window and put the speakers in the window and cranked that 150 watt amp up to everything it would do. And uh, so the four tops were, were playing, and, uh, and it was blaring up at the, at the hill. There's a, there was a fellow in my fraternity, John Beagle, and John Beagle wore a hard hat, and when that hard hat went on, mischief would follow <laughs> every time. Well, notwithstanding it was early in the morning, uh, he'd been drinking, as we say, right smart. And he gets this call, and the call goes something like this. Hello? This is Dean Atwood. Don't you know we have classes going on? And uh, there was a pause. And Beagle said, Dean Atwood, do you know who this is? <laughs> and Atwood goes, no. And he goes, good. Go, <laughs> go blank yourself. <laughs> As I say, there, there was that as well. You know, when, when I think about I'm, it, you know, I'm, told, I'm told that the phone rang for about another 45 minutes. And <laughs> <laughs> what, what was your own <coughs> dilemma about, uh, about the Vietnam situation? Well, I think going to Washington Lee and, and stepping back from all the experience we had, uh, the draft was not egalitarian. I mean, we had options that other people didn't. Uh, and we didn't understand that because it was, as you said, kind of a cocoon. Um, there was a military and at one point it was graduate school or divinity school, whatever the case might be. Those were options that were available to most people. So I too uh, was searching around for what my options might be. Uh, and I'd finally met somebody who'd go out with me for the second time. <laughs> uh, and and we, it was a serious relationship, <laughs> to say the least. And so uh, getting married, which I had not planned to do immediately, and I dare say Betty hadn't either, became a priority uh, because I knew if we were going to be separated uh, that it might not work out. Uh, and, and so we became engaged, got married, and then I went down to Christ School and taught. Uh, the point that has come through, other than John, the, the, the inflection points for me were two. One was the, uh, the physical, when I realized that this was more imminent than I had realized. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, to go to an induction physical, it, it, it ain't tryouts for, for the Chippendales. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so that, that, that was one inflection point, and the second that really came crashing down for me was Barry's death. Uh, I, I remember how profoundly I was hit by that. And otherwise, uh, while I was very uncomfortable with the Vietnam War, it was something that I was trying to avoid. And that's where most of my energies were. So I went down to Christ School, taught, really liked teaching and thought about uh, going back to graduate school in English and making teaching my profession. So uh, I benefited from that. I benefited from uh, marrying, as Alex had said, little Betty Miller 
uh, <laughs> and we're, we're still married. So. I actually said the butchous Miss Betty Nelson. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Is Betty here, by the way? No? No. Uh, I, uh, you know, the Washington and Lee of that era is really kind of a mystery to me in some respects. Mm -hmm. For instance, you were pointing out how uh, there was classes at eight o'clock on big weekends, mm -hmm. you know. Saturday. But if you recall, we all had to pay what they call a, an, a you know, what an entertainment fee or a student fee mm -hmm. or activities fee. Activities fee. That's right. <laughs> well. For the most part, the student activities fee that we all paid for was used to throw a university-wide free cocktail party at the beginning of every big weekend. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this was a big cocktail party. I remember one of them was out at Zalman's and they mm -hmm. were serving, the university was serving everybody on the premises, grain punch. Mm -hmm. And when it was over, Zalman's looked like the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> so, you know, compare the kind of culture that you know Washington and Lee more or less has morphed into. And, and remember also, we were 68. In 70, that was Kent State, the university mm -hmm. really changed profoundly at that moment, I think, in some significant ways. And when that, you know, I don't guess there are any class of uh, 45th reunion people here. If there are, oh, there are, good. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that worked, because you were through, mm -hmm. you know, you, you experienced that. But the point I guess I'm making is, when you look at the culture that we were in in 1968 here at Washington mm -hmm. and Lee, what most surprises you about the way it was? Do you have a thought about that? It, I, I think it was the acceptance of uh, looking in the rearview mirror some things that were mm -hmm. well nigh laughable. Uh, the assimilation committee, for one. Uh, we all we all recall that where if you didn't speak on the colonnade you were brought before the assimilation committee <laughs> uh, and you were punished uh, it seems like a a good idea but an absurd way to deal with it <laughs> so that was one that particularly struck me a uh, conventional uh, conventional dress died a more uh, protracted, tortured <laughs> course, uh, but that 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 real pull towards being conventional mm -hmm. uh, seemed to me to be way overdone and and good to be rid of. Dudley, from your perspective, was there an anti-war movement? At, uh, at Washington and Lee at that time? Uh, no, um, <laughs> there wasn't. Uh, now, there were a few of us. Um, I could, and I, we knew each other, maybe 30 people who um, were part of that movement, and we would know each other in Washington when we were marching, and we would, uh, you know, talk about it on a, on a weekly basis. <laughs> So in some ways, there were just uh, a few of us, but the, the positive of that was we knew each other and we had you know, quite a, a strong uh, you know, conversation, ongoing conversation the whole time, um, uh, the whole four years I was here. So Washington and Lee, because uh, I had such a focus really on trying to understand uh, what democracy was going to look like in, uh, you know, 1968. I mean, that was really what I was, uh, you know, trying to understand. Um, Washington and Lee was like a backdrop to this kind of search um, that we were all on in different ways. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't deeply immersed in Washington and Lee. In it wasn't the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. There was something else. But it became this sort of fascinating backdrop to what I was uh, trying to understand. And so although, um, you know, there was only a small community, that didn't feel uh, limiting in any way. 
because that small community of anti-war civil rights activists at the university was in a really strong conversation and we had allies, a few allies on the faculty and we were also close with them. One of the, um, you know, sort of hallmarks of my experience uh, here was how close I was to two or three faculty members, not just as a student, but as a, uh, you know, so as an intellectual uh, companion. So I'd spend a lot of time with faculty outside of the classroom, in their home, uh, that kind of thing. So there, there was a discourse here, but it was, uh, definitely a minority discourse. Our plan is that we open now to the audience uh, and we welcome not only the members of the class of 68 but members of any class and also spouses to to speak. Uh, this is something we want to have as a real conversation but I want to start with Professor Gunn who uh, is joined us today and who was here and member of the faculty in 1968. Professor Gunn, is there anything you would like to say? We don't have mics for the audience, so I will repeat if, if need be, if you can't uh, understand. I would pick up on the point that Dudley just made. Uh, you said that what, perhaps 30 people in your group, well two years later, it was a whole campus. And if you don't know, you surely should know, in 1970, after Kent State, when, we, when, the, when the whole country rose up in protest, Washington and Lee, to your surprise and mine, became the capital of the eastern part of the United States. We were known at Dudley as Berkeley East. We were truly, the, the students went on strike, we had no classes. They were demanding that uh, the term be ended, students be given full credit for all courses in which they were enrolled, and uh, be free to go to Washington to protest or uh, whatever they chose. There, there were 18 lines of telephone into the, the reception room in the old student union, the, the, the communication center for the entire part of the country east of the Mississippi River. Uh, the, 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 there was a sit-in in the president's office. Uh, there was a threat to burn the ROTC building. The Doesn't sound much like Washington and Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, Not the one we knew. It, it, it totally changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there were hmm. alternative universities, so to speak, with classes on the front campus taught by some of the professors you were with whom I'm sure you were communicating. We had an all-day faculty meeting that broke for lunch, came back after lunch, broke for dinner, met mm -hmm. until 10 o'clock. Things were tense. I would not like to go through those years again, that week again, but some good things came out of it, and I thought we were generating a new generation of great leaders. I think the WNL faculty came up with the best solution in the country. What, what we did was to say any student who felt his obligations were elsewhere could take one course for incomplete, two, three, four, or everything. Mm. Uh, and uh, the incomplete to be finished within 12 months. I don't remember exact numbers, but more than 200 students took incompletes and mm. everything and left campus. And many of them did. Mm. Uh, and uh, I would comment also, several of you have spoken of the, of the several different revolutions that were happening at that time. The civil rights mm -hmm. movement, the sexual revolution, the free speech movement. They were all merged together in That's some right. ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they changed our country fundamentally. In fact, at WNL, it went away so fast. I mean, the next fall, school began, and nobody seemed to realize that it had happened. <laughs> but things were different. Mm. There was better communication between students and faculty than I think there had ever been before. So uh, the spring term was adopted at student request. The free, the independent exam schedule was adopted at student request, and uh, 
Well, it was an exciting time all together. Could, could I ask a member of the, of the 45th reunion <coughs> class to talk about what they experienced as a student here at that time? Is anyone? Yes, can you? Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, <coughs> Professor. I'm so grateful for your reminder mm. of that because I thought it was something I'd forever. <laughs> 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 it was a <coughs> exciting and disturbing time here at Washington, um, 1970, my sophomore year. And or freshman year, can't remember. Um, <laughs> got here in '69, right? Um, it was the spring of your freshman year. Spring of my freshman year, Kent State was, I think, the biggest catalyst of this. Um, it it was a sucker punch for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't ignore it, the situation anymore. I, I grew up in a household that was very Republican. My dad was very conservative. I came to campus with. <coughs> pro-Vietnam views. Um, I would say my whole political life changed while I was here, in a way it usually doesn't when you come to Denver. Um, and it changed for a lot of us. I remember, I, I think the faculty uh, response was absolutely one of the glorious things that I've ever seen. Um, it was reasoned, but it, it also gave space for students who did not want to go along this, what they saw as a crazy thing. I remember being in the Evans Dining Hall for a rally and every people standing on tables and screaming and some people threatening violence. And I was like, I, it scared me. But it also really changed me. Uh, and I think our whole, our, the whole class and people who were here then changed for a long time in a lot of different ways. I think there was a great deal of retrenchment later after President Reagan was elected. But that generation was very different and in, in ways that didn't have directly to do with Vietnam. Uh, my senior year as uh, editor of Bring Come Phi, I championed co-education. We had a re student referendum which passed. It only took the university 15 more years. <laughs> <laughs> What made that possible was was the galvanized uh, the galvanization of the student body during that 1970 time. And thank you for reminding Absolutely. us of it, and thank you for being one of the leaders to keep keep us engaged, but also keep our heads intact. <laughs> I want to get back to '68, uh, and I want to especially uh, Ellis Johnson and Andy Blair uh, have come in. Uh, they came, we have been talking in part about Barry and about Barry's death and how it affected people. Wick was saying how this was a flex point for him. Uh, I know that Barry was very close to both of you. Uh, I don't know whether you have anything you'd like to say about that now, but I just wanted to recognize the fact that it was a very powerful, certainly very powerful factor in the way I experienced 1968. Yeah, it was. That's right. Uh, I'd like to have more memories of '68 or more observations. Yes, John. Uh, when I <clears throat> went through and looked at the Bob Keith second 50th calyx, I think there were 151 responses, and I was curious as to how many people had gone into the military one way or another, because, you know, with our largely southern heritage and uh, going to wealth and leisure the further south you went. You know, we did have opportunities to explore other options, but <coughs> 99, I believe, of the 150 went in the service. They may have gone into the reserves, a lot of them did. They went on active duty, they enlisted, they came in through ROTC. So that left 50 people in our responders that did not uh, go into the service. And you've got guys that don't physically qualify, you've got people with medical school, dental school. So I would say that despite the, the pangs, the, entering college when there was no marijuana, 
<laughs> there was a little marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, it's sort of the uh, we were the last we were the last of the mainstream people of World War II. The same way the class mm -hmm. of seventy was a whole different generation. And but I think that most of us did step up and do what we have we were supposed to do. And you were exactly right. You're trying to figure out how in the hell can I get through this and not get killed. But I will say this: I applaud all of you for your convictions and your solutions. And I'd like to thank everybody here who actually served in Vietnam in particular for their service to our country. Thank you. Uh, thinking of 68, I think I was like a lot of us, really oblivious of what really was going on mm -hmm. in the civil rights and in the Vietnam War, unfortunately. I think because I was really caught up with my studies and really enjoying them. But when it came to April 4th, of 1968. It was right after lunch and I was standing in Evans dining hall. And I've never forgotten that moment. And then when it came to June 6th, mm -hmm. you know, I was in my little house, pretty, pretty close here in town, and you just shook your head, you know, you could not believe that such a thing could have happened. And I suppose this is sort of the sickness of the feeling that it didn't kind of blossom until later realize just the magnitude of, of these events. You know, it's interesting, John, that the, I was, as I was sort of thinking about how this conversation might go, it struck me really for the first time that when we came here as freshmen, Jack Kennedy had been assassinated less than a year before. Mm -hmm. But it had seemed like way, way behind, way away. And then when in 68, Martin Luther King, and then during our graduation, uh, Bobby Kennedy, it was like, you know, a blow upon a bruise, but I didn't even really know the bruise was there because I think that somehow coming to Washington and Lee at that time, for me anyway, was, you know, the, what happened in Dallas has, was something that was history, but really had mm -hmm. very little to do with my sense of what the world was that I was occupying here. Who else? Yes. Mary. Yeah, um, I wanted to reflect on something Rick said, and I, I don't know whether he and I were on the bus to Rona for our pre-induction physicals together, <laughs> um, but we, we got a notice. Um, I was there, Bird Moser was on the bus, um, and there were a bunch of farm boys yeah. from, from, from the Lexington area. Um, we all went down there, and almost to the man, uh, every WNL student had a medical dossier about what their medical problems were. <laughs> Frog sinuses. And we disqualify them for, for service. Um, at the same time, there were these farm boys who were dying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably not a good choice of words. To get, it, to get in, there was, I, I remember there was a young, a young man um, at the physical and he had high blood pressure when they took his blood pressure. Mm. And the uh, guys at the center in, in Roanoke sent him across the street to have a couple of beers <laughs> and told him to come back because mm. they thought the beers would drop his, his blood pressure. Mm. Um, there was a young man who was half deaf, and when they told him, when they did his his uh, hearing exam, and they told him he wasn't going to qualify, he was crushed. And so I, I came to Washington and Lee from an all boys prep school, um, and I was used to, to this culture. And I think that particular experience opened my eyes to. Um, class differences that I never really thought about before. Mm -hmm. Being on that bus, all of us going down to Roanoke, the WNL guys all trying to figure out how are we going to stay out of this trail, and the farm boys all trying to figure out how am I going to serve my country. Right. It was such a stark difference to me, and I remember it to this day like it was yesterday. 
Well, I, mm -hmm. I think that you are on to something important, and mm -hmm. I remember this is something that was very much on my mind. I got called uh, in the fall of 68 by the woman who ran the draft board in my hometown in Tennessee, and she said, when you're coming home for Thanksgiving, I want you to come see me. She'd been running the draft board since World War II. And my family owned the newspaper in that town. I went to see her, her name was Monty Hunt, and she said, I just want to tell you that uh, you're not going to get a deferment when you graduate. When you graduate, you are mine. And what I understood her to mean was that I, as the son of privilege in that town, was not going to be able to get away with skating mm -hmm. through grad school when, as you said, these farm boys are going and putting their lives on the line. And I actually remember thinking that there was justice to that, that it was a rich man's war, poor man's fight kind of situation, and I really did not want to be on the side of, of skating. And that's why when George W. Bush you know, went for the Air National Guard, I knew what he'd done. Everybody who lived through that knew what that meant and what that signified. And I didn't want to die in Vietnam. And that's why I tried to get Barry Crosby to do something to keep from being drafted. Because it wasn't worth dying for, but it was, as far as I was concerned, the calculus I made, it was important to me personally that I not, you know, do something dishonorable. And why I might not think it was dishonorable, my father might. And that meant a lot to me. That mattered a lot to me. Who else would like to speak? Yeah. <clears throat> Professor Gunn, your revelations about 1970 here at WML, I think a lot of us were shocked to hear that. Mm -hmm. I, I had not, I didn't know that story, and it was overwhelming, but I wanted to, to give a different perspective on that. I was serving in Vietnam when the Cambodian incursion occurred that seemed to trigger the Kent State uh, riots. I didn't know that had come to WNL, which was, I, I think it hit me today, but it was, it was heartening. And uh, I went, I hope that I would have been someone here at that time that would have been incensed. But the other perspective, being in Vietnam, my first six months there, there was a real war going on, and my life was threatened daily, mostly in the evening when rockets and mortars came in. But after the Cambodian incursion, which was a bloodless incursion, there was no war in Vietnam for the next six months because the, the quote, enemy, NBA, and et cetera, had no arms, had no ammunition, and had no food or clothing. So being in Vietnam, we were celebrating <coughs> that in huge fashion because a, a big part of the conversation was we didn't want to avoid our duty, but we didn't want to go to Vietnam and get killed. So we, our mission of not getting killed had been accomplished by that, and our whole country back home kind of went to its own war. So that was just a, it was an amazing dichotomy of seeing those two things happen. Just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Uh, one of my, uh, I finished. Uh, uh, was deferred, ROTC was deferred for law school, so I came right back to law school. And I think forever, one of my strongest memories of law school will be right after Kent State, on the front lawn, Bob Huntley was standing in front of a, a podium, right in front of Lee Chapel, and the student body was arrayed across the lawn. And the student body shouted him down. And he had to, finally had to quit and walk away. And I was a senior in law school then, and for, well, senior law students were all out staying there with our conventional dress on, and the rest of the student body, uh, the college student body was on the lawn in shorts and t-shirts and whatever. But um, that moment to me said more about what happened mm. here than anything I can remember. <clears throat> yes? I'm in the 45th class. I was there. Um, I was very impressed with Robert Edward Royal Hunt before keeping it together, and John, I think he might have been the uh, person who suggested uh, being a good contract lawyer as he was, that 
we would need to honor our contract to the students to offer the classes. And yet, anybody who didn't want to go didn't have to. As I remember, we had to have everything turned in by September 30th, uh, the next year. <coughs> But uh, just looking at the, the movement, it was personal and it was international. Uh, it was kind of like, this is a foreign policy that's obviously going to fail. We don't need to be mm -hmm. six feet under to uh, reinforce something that's impossible. And my thought at the time was, of course the whole Ivy League is up in arms and they're all in Washington filling them all. If people from Washington and Lee do this, that says a little bit more because of our reputation as a bastion of, I'll, I'll optimistically call it progressive conservative thought. Back then it wasn't a contradiction. People <laughs> 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 like John Warner might have the ear of Richard Nixon, who, whatever else mm. he was, was a total opportunist. Mm. And it could have made a difference. That, that's that's what I was. That was the brick wall I was beating my head. I think what this. Fine. I think what this says, if nothing else, is that starting next two years from now, the reunions, 50th reunions, are going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, who else would like to have to share something about that time and about their sort of sense of WNL at that time? I know that there are people in this room who saw, like you, really serious combat, who were very much uh, at risk, like Barry was, and who many of you, well, they thank God came back. Um, I think that I don't want to open old wounds, but I just wondered if those, some of you, Stu. I did serve in Vietnam as an infantry officer. Um, I think it's important to remember that the Vietnam War was not the come to respect, I've thought about the war a lot in the last three years, probably more than I have in the last 45. I've really come to respect people like Dudley who really put themselves at risk with their protests of the war because it was a bad war. Uh, I have the greatest respect for the people who served uh, and I have great respect for those who fought it. I don't have a lot of respect, quite honestly, for those who went to Sweden. Couple things. One, I came back here in 1970 uh, during a leave, and I went to the Beta House to see Otis and the Bank Gangbangers playing, <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing going on. There. So I went over to the Fidel House, and I walked down to the basement, and there were these people sitting around listening to psychedelic music, <laughs> smoking pot. So that to me was the great, the great change that I saw around that time. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think Dr. Gunning has reiterated. It was incredible to me. And I'd also like to say that the tragedy, one of the big tragedies to me of Vietnam is we haven't learned anything. We have this war going on in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. These brave young Americans are going over there. And it's, it's unwinnable. And we mm -hmm. just haven't learned. Mm -hmm. so I've asked people, what's winning? They have no idea. Yeah. They have no idea. And it's, it, that's the tragedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. I want you to know that, that uh, Dudley was preparing to go to jail. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know that this was of any value to his plea, uh, which actually did finally come through. But I was in the Gulf of Tonkin on an aircraft carrier, and I stole some ship stationery and wrote a letter on behalf of Dudley from the Gulf of Tonkin. <laughs> it didn't uh, hurt. <laughs> and I, I do go see Barry's name every time. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Every time. Anybody? Yes. I, I want to reflect on something different. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you remember the Thornton sisters. Oh, yeah. Um, two oh, times. Yeah. Who, uh, <clears throat> who would come from North Jersey. Uh, on the weekend and, and play here. And probably 20 years after we graduated, I somehow turned on a program, I think, What's My Line, if you remember, of course. remember that program. And one of the Thornton sisters was on there. Um, and, and I subsequently saw a CBS or somewhere, maybe on public television in New Jersey, 
the, sort of the story of the Thornton sisters, all of whom, there were four sisters and a mother who played in a, in a band. And all of them went on to go to college and graduate school. Uh, one of them became a doctor, the other a PhD in, uh, in, in psychology. Um, and uh, I remember seeing that and thinking, who would have thunk <laughs> that, that these young women who were playing in the basement of the ZBT house often, you know, were going to sort of benefit from, uh, from being down here and being able to make some money and take it back to, to New Jersey and, uh, and, and the stark contrast between who they were and who we were uh, when we were here. But, yeah. uh, but it always made me happy to see uh, that they were able to thrive. Uh, That's great. You know, Barry was a kind of an impresario even before he came to Washington and Lee. I met him the summer before our freshman year at, at a Virginia Beach show that he was promoting. I don't know if it was the Thornton sisters, but it was... <laughs> It was, it was the hot nuts. It was the hot nuts, right? <laughs> How can I forget that? I don't think any of them became doctors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, yeah, John. Um, many of us were born in 1946. So we were the leading generation of Thornton sisters. Yeah. Uh, we were the leading generation of after World War II. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me at some point that many of our fathers, most of our fathers, were probably <clears throat> in World War II. Mm -hmm. So they were, many of them were survivors of World War II. And so we were the sons of the survivors. And we were the sons of the mothers who thank their stars, thank their stars that their husband, you know, or the man they married, came home. Well, I think that's just a perspective that we, we share. Uh, I agree. We were raised, and we, we all speak of our, we all feel like a sense of duty about it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Wendell Wynn. Um, I don't want to take away from all that's been shared because 1968 was life changing for all of us. But I don't want to lose sight of what happened, you know, the three years prior to that. And the thing that has profoundly meant so much to me were the, the Band of Brothers uh, connection to some of us made. Uh, in many cases throughout the training house. Uh, Wake and myself and four other black cats. Um, Form of friendship has lasted for 50 years, and I think all of us can share similar experiences. So there was something serendipitous and maybe innocent about you know those early years, but that I value very much. And I just want to sort of throw that. I'm glad. Happy. I'm glad you mentioned that, Wendell. That's, I, I'm, I want to end on a positive note about the memories. We were walking around the campus yesterday afternoon, beautiful day, and we came upon uh, Doremus Jim. And the immediate thing that bur burst into my mind was the night that I watched James Brown there. <laughs> I suspect many of you remember that as well. Yeah. It was, what a show. You remember he called back on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> but also uh, Dora Remus Jim was Phil Oaks in one of yeah. the most yeah, wonderful yeah, singular yeah. concerts. Phil yeah. had concert. gone to school up up the Valley Pike there at Stanton Military Academy. So yeah. uh, that was a, he's a interesting song, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. May I sneak in one uh, anecdote uh, followed up on Wicks 150 amp. Uh, his memory serves me. The draft deferment exam was held in the old Rotsy building. And it might have been a homecoming weekend. The windows were open. And you could hear the, the drums going. We got to take the exam under that basement. <laughs> yeah. I got my results and uh, I thought I'd been drafted in a very official looking envelope. And I passed it and then they promptly threw it out. <laughs> <threw> <laughs> Uh, pass that off for those of you. No, I, 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 took, took, the I took the test too and yeah. thought I, you know, again. Uh, are there any women who would like to speak? You know, honestly, I would welcome uh, a perspective from uh, the distaff side of this, uh, of this very... Anybody? No? Okay. Well, look, on the, on the 
note of James Brown crawling back on stage. <laughs> uh, we will end this first hour. We're going to immediately go into the second hour of this morning's program. I want to thank, especially thank the panelists. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And if you will just disengage from your microphones and uh, the second panel, please ascend. We'll press on. First of all, I want to uh, once again introduce you to Jack Ware, who is the recipient of the Class of 1968 scholarship and uh, who didn't want to come, but someone broke his leg and made him come. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jack, would you like to say a word or two? Uh, sure. You can speak from there. I just want to thank all of you guys for providing this. Is this working? No? Okay. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank all of you guys for... Is it working now? Okay, there we go. I want to thank all of you guys for providing and making this scholarship happen. And I also wanted to thank you just for sharing your memories here. Um, it's been very interesting just to sit in the back and kind of be a fly on the wall and kind of get a feel for what WNL was back in your all's time. And, you know, it was very interesting and I'm excited to learn some more. So, thank you guys. David Doherty told me that they're lined up uh, 10 deep at the urinals, so we'll give a, a, few, a, few, uh, a, few, a few more moments. We all, we all know that we're, in that respect, a little more vulnerable these days. <laughs> um, you know, it was interesting. Last night, uh, I was at the... Uh, the the hospitality room at the hotel and uh, was talking with, with, in fact, Barry Levin, who you heard speak a little earlier. And he said, you know, I want to apologize. I, I didn't send in my, you know, uh, advice, my reflection, um, because I didn't think anybody would really be interested in what I had to say in the class of 2018. Well, let me explain a little bit about what we on the you know, reunion committee had in mind for this hour. Uh, the idea was to put it in the form of advice to the class of 2018. But it was also, we hoped, uh, a chance for the members of our class, because of this or for whatever reasons to come, to reflect because we're now at that at that inflection point in our lives when we we're taking stock and trying to figure out, you know, what it was all about and what we did learn. Barry said, you know, nobody would be interested and that may be true. But I, but I also thought to myself, well, what if when we were the class of 1968, we'd had the chance to listen to some people from the class of 1918? would we have been in any way interested in what they had to say about life that they knew uh, that we were about to embark upon? I mean, they had, uh, World War I had just ended. Uh, the prohibition was starting. Uh, the depression was something they were living through then and World War II and the post-war era. And it seemed to me that if we'd had that opportunity, uh, if we'd been smart, we actually would have been interested in what they had to say. Not what they had to say about the details of life, but about the large issues of life. Coping with problems, coping with, with values, and deciding who and what we were as we went through what has now for all of us been a 50-year period. Um, and, you know, we, you know, I hope we're going to be gathered again, but uh, it, we all know that we're looking at a moment in time for us that is a reflective time, rather than one that is necessarily going to be, you know, heading into the, into the world anew, like the class of, of 2018. So that was the idea, and a number of you, nearly 40 of you did respond, um, including uh, the folks on this panel. So we're going to talk about these things for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up again to the audience, and again to the spouses and the women and the members of the class of 2018 who are here. I see a few people who look 
rather 2018-ish. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you notice I haven't been introducing the panel. I figured you all knew who they were or could find them in the, in the calyx. So I'm going to continue with that. We're going to start with David Doherty. Now, David Doherty, uh, as you probably know, was the uh, headmaster of the Hill School very successfully for many years. Uh, he also, when he was sending his, uh, his advice in, if you haven't looked at that compilation that was put together by Washington and Lee, I commend it to you. I hope you will. As I said, it's going to be put into a booklet form and given to the members of the class of 2018. There's some interesting stuff there. Some's very reflective, some funny, some sort of a rant. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's some of that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, David's, David started with the thought that failure has been, for him, perhaps the great teacher. David, if you would. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Um, I've, I've told this story more than once, so it's, um, it's pretty well rehearsed, uh, but it's also uh, one that uh, first time through or the 50th time through, I recognize as the most important experience of my life. I'm not the first person to divine this idea. All of us have failed and all of us uh, look back on moments of failure as turning points or at least important points uh, in our lives. But um, maybe because uh, here I bought into a lot of uh, what WNL was about, even frankly, uh, Wick reminded me, the Assimilation Committee um, or the um, uh, the, the automatic rule, there was a clarity and a, and a, and a sharpness to that that uh, I did find odd, but at least uh, uh, clear. And, and you may remember the automatic rule was not just about uh, academics and grade point ratios. You could be required to leave the university if you did not attend the first day after a vacation or the last day before a vacation, Thanksgiving, Christmas, spring vacation during the year. Or if you didn't attend one of the convocations, the Lee Jackson Day uh, meeting in Doremus, if you didn't go to those, you were out of the university. And it was, it was so bizarre, so draconian, that nobody challenged uh, <laughs> those, uh, those regulations. But somehow, as clear as all that was to me, I too, after the uh, uh, freshman camp, uh, looked to my left and looked to my right, but failed to look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> and those two fellows did just fine. <laughs> and at the end of my freshman year, I was a victim um, of the automatic rule. And there was no question about it. W.W. Pusey smiled demurely at my application for uh, reconsideration, but he knew and I knew that uh, I had to leave at the end of that first year. Two C's and three F's in the second semester secured uh, my, um, my departure. Um, I was uh, embarrassed. Uh, I was most of all hurt for my parents, uh, neither of whom had gone to college, both of whom had worked very hard to give me an education in boarding school, Episcopal High School here, Washington and Lee. Uh, no two uh, people could have done more uh, for their son than they did for me, and I blew it. Um, I was um, upset uh, facing my friends, uh, former teachers at, uh, at Episcopal. But even then, there was a, a, a cluelessness or maybe even a defiance in me that did not want to hear from anybody how I had to uh, right this ship. And uh, two important events. Um, first of all, I was called by the draft board. Uh, and so I had to face that reality, which I hadn't thought seriously about before. Uh, until I was at Fort Holabird in Baltimore uh, being um, uh, examined, uh, but then uh, uh, deferred uh, for a, uh, 
you know, a relatively minor physical uh, issue, a perforated eardrum. And I was, I was told right then that I would be uh, deferred. So in a sense, I didn't have to think so seriously about that issue uh, as, um, as, as others of you all did. But then looking for a college, looking for some place to go uh, was a different story. And we spent the whole of that coming summer uh, finding a school, uh, ultimately Transylvania College in Lexington, Kentucky, where I would go for the next year. You, I'm sure, have heard of Transylvania. Dracula was an undergraduate there <laughs> <laughs> shortly before I enrolled. And it, it was, it was a, a, just an, an extraordinary experience. I had terrific teachers. I made wonderful friends. And I, I had never worked as hard in my life as I did then. Um, and at the end of that year, I applied for readmission uh, to the uh, uh, executive committee of the, uh, of the faculty, was, uh, uh, was welcomed back, decided to return and not stay at Transylvania. Uh, but then when I came back, uh, I visited all the members of the executive committee who had uh, voted on my application. And every one of them, teachers, uh, administrators, uh, were just wonderful in welcoming me uh, to return to Washington Lee. And understand the spirit in which I uh, offer this. I went finally to the office of uh, Dean Atwood. Uh, for those of you who didn't know Dean Atwood, you uh, wives or uh, younger people, he was the quintessential dean of students. He was a ex-marine, he had this marvelously chiseled, chiseled jaw, he had elbow patches when they were popular <laughs> on tweed jackets that didn't need elbow patches, he smoked a <laughs> pipe. He was, he was just an extraordinary physical specimen. And uh, I sat down at his, in his office and by that time I was, I was just gushy with enthusiasm. There were gee whizzes, there were gollies, I was so keen on returning. And he looked at me with those steely gray blue eyes and said, you will never make it. <laughs> he said, those Transylvania A's, they're not Washington and Lee A's. And I was devastated. I have no recollection of the rest of the, uh, of the meeting with him. And for a very long time, whenever I flagged, whenever I let down my guard, whenever I stopped uh, working as hard as I could work, I thought about that moment. And it made me so angry. I could not believe that anybody could say that to somebody who was gee whizzing his way through a conversation <laughs> like that. And yet, I saw Dean Atwood years later actually uh, talk with him about a position down here before uh, uh, deciding uh, on, a, on a different career path. But I with all my heart want to believe and have, and have come to believe that he did that on purpose. He knew that I needed something like that uh, to, um, uh, to push me, and it did, and it still does in a way. Uh, so at the end of all of this, I graduated with my class. It was really important to be with y'all in 1968. Um, I became an educator. I served in independent schools for 44 years. Uh, I had extraordinary empathy for kids who were, who were clueless or uh, failing. And um, I, finally this, I used to say in my headmastering days at the Hill School to parents at the opening of school every year, every one of us has had an experience of failure that we regard now as a turning point in our lives. What is it about us today that wants to keep our kids, protect our kids from those same kinds of failures that we believe were the turning points in our lives. I usually got nods and thank yous at that time, but uh, understandably, lots of parents uh, had a, t a tough time um, digesting that uh, in the long haul, but so let's hear it for failure. <laughs> <laughs> George, you, you were, uh, you responded uh, focused on the importance of being flexible when, I don't know whether you'd call it failure, but when your plan does not turn out to be God's plan, if you will. Uh, would you talk about that? 
Well, I think the thing that we probably everyone in this room has learned at some point um, is that just when you think you know what's going to happen in your life, probably doesn't. Um, you you go through school and you you have a major and you have a pretty good idea of where you're headed or, or what you want to accomplish, and uh, you probably, as a graduating senior, have have that uh, thought. But the truth is, uh, our crystal ball is not very good, and uh, we're going to probably 50 percent or more of you will not end up on a career path that you currently are even thinking about. In my own life, as an example, I, I, uh, my father had a building materials company. And from the time I was knee high to a duck, uh, it was always assumed that I was going to run this building materials company. Um, after the service, I went back to St. Louis. And sure enough, I went to work for my father in the building materials business. And uh, he moved me to Florida because they had a Florida operation, which I didn't want to do. I had no desire to go to Florida. I was happy to be back in St. Louis. But I went. And uh, three years later, my dad sold the company. So the idea of me continuing in the building materials business, which also was just seeing the advent of a little company called Home Depot, um, <laughs> seemed to be not exactly the best path for me. And at that time, I. Uh, uh, took about three years to get to extricate myself from getting rid of that uh, the real estate that this uh, that we owned as a part of this company, and I decided to go into real estate. And that's too long a story to say why I did, but I can suffice it to say that no one in my family had ever done that. No one had ever been in real estate. I wasn't sure what a deed was, or a lien was, or any of the other things that uh, uh, you deal with in real estate, um, but. That career change, totally unexpected, ha has turned out pretty well for me. Um, and I never saw it coming. And there was, no, there was no training here in the business school about real estate in those days. Um, and it's still actually more limited than I think it should be, but nonetheless, um, what WL does do is it prepares you to deal with changes. And because you have a liberal arts education, unless you've already picked pre-med, let's say, as an example, uh, they're going to give you an education here that's going to, that gives you the opportunity to meet different challenges and to go in whatever direction life ultimately leads you. So my advice to the class in terms of that would be, be flexible and be opportunistic. Look for opportunities that may not be on the path that you're currently on. You know. Um, Few of us, like John Godin, always knew he wanted to be a doctor, and he was a doctor for 40 plus years. Uh, Charlie here thought he was going to be an attorney. And ended up. Done lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, very flexible. He's had more, had more jobs than probably most of us combined in here. Um, but it, it really, it, that's, it, if I had a piece of advice, I would say the good news is Debbie Nell's prepared you. And, we all are the beneficiaries of a wonderful learning experience here, and I think it will do well for you no matter where those opportunities lead you. Thanks, George. Uh, Bob, your response focused in part, and but significantly, on the honor code and what that had sort of meant to you as you have pursued a career. One of the questions that we put to people was how did Washington and Lee affect you and how did you use the experience you had here in your life for the past 50 years? Would you talk about sure, that? Sure, sure. Um, just a quick comment on what George was saying about the need to be flexible uh, and because things are not likely to turn out how you might expect them to turn out. Uh, but I think there's one thing that we can take away from our experience here at Washington and Lee is the honor code. Uh, it's simple to say that we don't lie, cheat, or steal. Um, but the honor code, I think, puts, if, if you live according to that lifestyle, which I think uh, we ought, uh, it puts you in a position to be able to deal with the vicissitudes uh, of life uh, and to make the decisions that are right because there's nothing there's nothing really uh, 
secret about the honor code. Uh, it wasn't something that uh, Robert E. Lee invented. You know, there was a sense of honor uh, for many, many years, all the way back to the Greeks. Uh, and to me, the honor code really is to live by one's conscience. I think, I think just about everybody knows about their conscience. They know the difference between right and wrong. But what's more difficult is to know what's right and what's wrong and to then make the right decision. It's not real easy always to do that. Um, so some of you in here may remember the Walt Disney movie Pinocchio, 1940. There was a little character in Pinocchio called Jiminy Cricket. And Jiminy Cricket sang a song, and that song had to do with let your conscience be your guide. Uh, and that's kind of what I have tried to do over the course of my career, <clears throat> and not, I mean, not even my professional career, but in my life. Um, when I was getting ready to, uh, to respond to Alex's request about life lessons, um, I asked my son Tim, who graduated from Washington and Lee in 2004, <clears throat> what he thought my experiences at Washington and Lee had as an impact on me in, in the way that he had seen my life. And he said he thought it was the honor code. That uh, the decisions that I, you know, I try to think about those things in everything I do. Uh, and certainly in my, in my professional career as well. Uh, I was an ethics counsel at a federal agency in Washington. And the federal executive branch has a very, actually has its own honor system. A lot like, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, it, and it's administered by a lot of very serious people because that system, if it's administered correctly, it does work. Uh, we deal with conflicts of interest. We deal with things as, such as accepting gifts, which should you take a gift from an entity with which you're doing business, that kind of thing. And uh, whether it's correct or incorrect is not always the ultimate question. And I think Charlie made a reference to this point that I'm going to make now is, and that is, when you're dealing with conflicts of interest, or whether you should accept a gift, there's the question of, of how does it appear? It might, you might, some fancy lawyer might be able to argue that a particular course of action is legally correct. But how does it appear? How does it appear to the public if, if an employee of Uncle Sam is making a decision that may be technically correct, but it looks terrible. How is the public going to react to that? Um, and Alex, as a newspaper person, you, you'll, you'll probably recognize the point that I'm going to make here. And that is that when we would go in to advise a political appointee about whether a particular course of action uh, was appropriate for that person, uh, and they were kind of on the fence, we had something we called the Washington Post test. And that test was how, how, sir, how, madam, would you feel if a story about your decision should appear on the front page of the Washington Post tomorrow? If you would be comfortable with how that would appear, you're, you're probably making the right decision. If you would not be comfortable, maybe you ought to decide it the other way. And you'd be surprised how often that impacted people. And the, you can see the lights going on uh, when you made that kind of comment to somebody. So uh, I would say that you know, in many, in many aspects of my life, the honor code that we had at Washington and Lee lives on. And I hope that for you members of the class of 2018 that it will live on for you and for everybody else as well. Because it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna impact you Personally, it can impact you in your career because in many corporate, in, in corporate, in the corporate world, you're going to find that there are ethics requirements 
for the company that you're going to end up working for. They, they have honor codes of one sort or another appear in many kinds of guises, and you're going to come across it. But you've always got, as a firm foundation, your Washington and Lee experience. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Charlie, you have probably had more diverse career than anyone and a very, very successful one, and you have been not only successful but generous. But uh, how do you make hard decisions about these kinds of things, changes, challenging situations? Well, considering my 14 employers since I graduated, <laughs> in, including four years as a diver and officer on the Navy's only troop-carrying submarine, plus uh, legions of mistakes and more than a few failures. Uh, most of you are probably saying, what in the hell are you doing up there giving advice? So let's call it uh, reflections as opposed to advice. So what's a good way to address problems is, is always an interesting issue. You know, the first, uh, my first approach to, to taking care of real problems was uh, as a Navy diver, we were taught if they weren't bullets or sharks or lightning uh, or otherwise life-threatening, the problems probably weren't that large and everything's relative, right? So, um, but in everyday life, problems do arise and then the question is, how do you deal with them? Uh, both in business and in personal life. Uh, my first suggestion is be careful who, who you share them with. Now let's face it, 85% of people don't really care about your problems. And so they're not gonna, they might, they might listen, but you're tiring them out. 10% uh, are really glad you have problems because they're miserable and they want you to join them in their misery. <laughs> and 5%, uh, including your spouse, and I've been very fortunate in that regard for the last 30 years, uh, want to do something to help. Uh, so then once you realize you have a problem, what do you do about it? Well, first you've got to face it uh, and develop a, a solution pretty quickly because the longer those issues fester, the worse they generally become. Uh, find the solution. Uh, often your spouse is very helpful in your personal life. To do that, I would say in my case, the vast majority of the times. Um, and then learn and move on and don't make excuses because it isn't just 85% of the people don't care about your problems, 99% of the people don't want to hear an excuse. Um, in business, it's better to develop a, a, a solution uh, as a team to include those who work with you and for you. Uh, in, in both personal and business lives, it's an iterative process. Uh, usually, if you're working with somebody else, uh, the decision is going to be a whole lot better than if you've come up with it on your own because it's tough to talk to yourself in a mirror and convince yourself that maybe you're wrong. Uh, but if you have people who are willing to talk frankly with you, it's, it's always better. Um, but in business... You seem to have a... <laughs> Charlie, here's a problem it. for you. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the switch? You found it. Um, in business, uh, we think we have big problems. Uh, in general, they're probably not, unless they happen to be ethical problems. Uh, our rule, or my rule, has always been in any business decision, uh, first, ask if it's legal. And then, ask if the legal decision, if it's legal, if the, uh, if the, the, the contemplated transaction or initiative uh, is ethical because if something's legal that doesn't ne necessarily mean it's ethical. And then the third question is, is it good business? If it's not good for your customers or your, or your, your patients or your clients, then it's not good business either. Uh, but at some point, if you're running a business, uh, you know, a decision has to be made. You can't wait too long. It's sort of a lead, follow, or get out of the way world uh, if a yeah, decision can't be made as, a, as a, a reasonable decision in a group. And then it's, you know, gee, I'm really sorry. This is the, it's a democracy if you vote right, but you didn't vote quite right. So here's the way we're going. And then you ask everybody, 
get on board. It's not illegal. It's not unethical. We may debate whether it's good business or not. Uh, but we'll find out down the road whether it is or not. So as a team, let's move forward. Uh, sometimes people just aren't willing to do that, and then you know, they have to go be part of a team someplace else. But that's the process I've used since before graduation. Before I open it to the uh, audience, I want to offer one piece of advice to the class of 2018 myself. Um, I'm sure you recall that Thomas Jefferson put in the, the Declaration of Independence that among your inalienable rights is the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I have a variation on that thought. Uh, one is the difference between pleasure and happiness. Uh, pleasure is uh, something you can manufacture. We are doing a lot of it this weekend, you know. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it is something that we are able to, to give ourselves in many respects. Happiness is kind of an abstract state that we apparently, from what I've read, all have a sort of a set point. And you're there in terms of your level of happiness. And if something great happens, you may go up, but then you'll go back down. And similarly, if something terrible happens, you'll come back up again eventually to that set point. But what I want to urge you to consider is the pursuit of joy. Joy is a different thing. It's a very ephemeral state. You may have felt it already. It's something that once you've experienced it, you will never forget. And it can be generated in all kinds of ways, but it has to be earned in some fashion. It's a kind of, of, of an exquisite, ecstatic state that doesn't last very long, as I say, but that says something to you about the glorious experience of having it, even for that very, very short time. I would commend you to look for those opportunities. I would bet that many of the people in this room have had that experience of joy perhaps many times. I haven't had it many times, but I've had it. And when I've had it, I've never forgotten it. I suspect some of you had it when you held your baby uh, in your arms for the first time or for some other reason that had to do with something that you couldn't have actually sort of expected it to be there, but it was something that seized you and gripped you and was, as I say, exquisite and priceless. I think that pursuing that, pursuing that instead of either happiness or pleasure is the way you will find you've got a set of memories that will be the ones that you cherish more than any others. With that, let me open it to the floor. I would like and encourage, as I say, the spouses in the room to speak. I would encourage everybody here to think about what they might want to offer to the class of 2018. John? Yeah, what? go ahead. John approached me yesterday uh, with, a, with, with some questions that he wanted to put before the, the group, and I asked him to address one in particular. Which is unfortunate because as I got to thinking about the common experiences that we all share, the questions just started to come and come and come about what has really happened in our lives that probably is common and interesting to us also. And this morning I've been so impressed to learn about what happened in 1970. I feel my, my experience at Washington and Lee is very much enlarged by knowing that, that that happened. So Alex won't let me go through this list, unfortunately, but <laughs> <laughs> believe me, these are really good questions. <laughs> <laughs> and the only one he's approved here is, <laughs> <laughs> what's the single richest or most extraordinary experience of your life? So it's not an easy question, but thank you. I thought you were going to give us the answer to it. <laughs> I get to raise the question. He was a philosophy major. Uh, <laughs> English. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Who would like to speak? Yes, Sue. Right, um, several years ago, there was a an article in the uh, alumni magazine. It was an article, it was a piece, and it was titled "The Unwritten Resume." And I don't know if any of you remember that, but. I thought it was a great piece, and I wish it 
would be published more often. But it talked about if you were graduated from Washington and Lee, you take with you credibility, and you take with you uh, the idea that you are someone who can be trusted. And if your word, if you say your word, your word is good. And I think that you have a gift in that unwritten resume when you graduate. You also have a responsibility to that unwritten resume when you graduate. And that's my advice to you. Uh, the other part that I'd just like to say it's off is, is so many of us have children who went here uh, that I think it, that in itself is a testament to the university, how we value it, and uh, what, it, what it taught us, so. Thank you, yes. My children, my children. <laughs> I wanna follow a little up with that, and particularly with uh, Bob's remarks. I think there's something about the honor code that may not be appreciated by undergraduates. Uh, in, in a career that it was both in business and in politics. I got uh, a chance to talk to a lot of people. I interviewed a lot of people. Uh, people would come to me and I'd make referrals. Because they, if they had come from WNL, I never had a hesitation. I always accepted a meeting that they requested. And I always would make recommendations to somebody in business if I thought they'd be a good person to talk to because I would never be embarrassed by it. And then, you know, in a world that these kids are going into, that all of us have been in in the last 20 years, the only way you get a job is through networking. The fact that WNL offers you a background that says to every other WNL graduate, this is somebody worth talking to, this is somebody who's never going to embarrass you, is actually probably the most valuable thing that you're going to get on a practical level in this university. Is that, is the mic working well? Because it, it was yeah. earlier. Could you all hear? I don't think it is. Testing. Yeah, now hold it close when you speak. Alex. Yes. I'd like to add a thought to that. Mm -hmm. um, it, some of you probably not very long ago read an article in Forbes magazine um, about Wall Street and the unusual number of Washington and Lee graduates in key positions at various companies in. Uh, on Wall Street. And the point of the article it, it was kind of like, why is this, what, what's going on here? Why, why are, from this little school that only graduates a few hundred students, um, why are there seems to be this disproportionate number of successful people there? And so I thought about that for quite a bit. and. Uh, I came away with, with a thought that it is all about honor and integrity. It's not about we're smarter than the other guys I don't, or gals. I don't believe that. Um, we get a great education here, but they get a great education at Harvard, and Princeton, Yale, and lots of other universities around the country. <coughs> it's not that we necessarily work any harder, because I guarantee you, you can find students that work just as hard or harder at the universities around this country. So. What is it that, that makes this difference? And I think it gets to the heart of what the honor system is all about. When we're here as students, it's just a matter of, when, at least when we first get here, it's a matter of, okay, I can't cheat, can't plagiarize, don't take anybody else's stuff from where it was and what have you. And we really don't appreciate what it's really teaching us until really until we're near graduation or until we actually get out into the real world and start to have to apply some of those principles. But I think it's because we do, because this little school generates a, a real love of honor and civility, um, practicing the golden rule, um, I think that is what makes the difference. Uh, I know in my business, I negotiate every day in real estate. And uh, a dear, and recently departed friend of mine, Wayne Heising, oftentimes said to me, he said, you know, it's only a good deal if it works for both person, both parties. And I don't think there's anybody I've ever known who ever did more deals than Wayne Heisinger. Um, mm -hmm. And so the fact that you, that people will see that you are dealing from a position of honesty and integrity and civility, I think that's what makes the difference. 
And I think that's why this little school generates as many successful people as it does. So live your life honorably. And uh, you know, it's, it's a corny old expression, but uh, Robert E. Lee said it, you know, be a gentleman. That's the key. Women, speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mary. By your comment about Troy, um, and, and speak, speak in, speak, hold it close, and speak in so we can hear you. I'm not sure that's. Oh, yeah. there it is. Yeah. I, I was taken by your comment about Joy, and uh, those of us in the 50th reunion class have probably had lots of those experiences. But since there are some younger people here, um, and I think WNL has offered this opportunity, I, I have found that some of the most joyful experiences I have had in my life have been in creating opportunities for others to experience joy. Um, and I think, for instance, the Shepherd program here, uh, we heard about the young man last night who was presenting at the ODK, the kind of public service that he has provided. There is no joy uh, greater, I think, than being able to create a sense of social justice in the world, and WNL is doing a great job of that. And for those of you who will be graduating and going out into the world, don't just look for the opportunity for you to have personal joy, but for the opportunity for you to create joy in others. And this is the guy last night who said he didn't have any advice to offer. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Ladies, yes. We we'll got we we'll get the microphone to you. Thank you. It's such interesting panels today and last night. Uh, I'm writing a book which has required some research into what are going to be the jobs of the future. And you look at technology changes, artificial intelligence changes, and the jobs of the future are hard to predict what they're going to be. But one stream runs through all of the job descriptions, and those are people want problem solvers, people who can figure out what the solution is. And that requires the broad kind of liberal arts education that you have at WNL, the kind of dedication to an honor code that you have at WNL. All the things that we've heard about over the last 24 hours are the things that are going to create opportunities for people in the future. And we don't know what they are. And you're going to run into some failures, which will make you stronger. And you'll take a left turn or a right turn as you go down that road. But with the skills you have here and the depth of the alumni support, you're just going to have wonderful opportunities and hopefully get some of that joy while it's happening. Dick, did you have something to say? Did you have something to say? I thought you were reaching for the microphone. No. Yes, here, Corbett. Let, let me, what, what? Uh, there are a lot of us in this room who are lawyers, so you know what I'm talking about when I say there's substance and there's we, we, Could you speak into the mic? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> just hold it close. Okay. I was just going to say that there, there are a lot of us in this room who are lawyers or want to be lawyers, maybe a, a few of those here too. And, and you know what I'm talking about when I say there's substance and there's procedure. I think we, uh, as WNL graduates or soon to be, uh, can be very helpful to this nation on the procedure side. And here's what I mean. There are a lot of people who go out in the world as activists for one thing or another. That's all wonderful. But more than anything, I think we need people who go out as activists for civility and the ability to communicate with each other, even though we disagree politically or whatever it is, uh, but to do that in an appropriate manner. And we are desperately in need of activists for that. So I would just encourage you, uh, graduates coming up, and those of us who are, our 50 years have gone by in a flash and, and so many things have happened, uh, I would just encourage you to add one more cause to your list of, of, of causes. I, I think that would be a great way for you to reflect well on WNL and, and to really pay back to the community or the nation uh, as a result of the wonderful training and experience you've had. So expanding the honor code a little bit further. Comments? Yes, yes. Kaz. Uh, so I'd like to build a little bit on uh, David's remarks. Uh, I remember the first parents' weekend here 
where the dean from Central Casting, Eddie the <laughs> uh, got up at the podium of Lee Chapel, and he said to the assembled parents, we don't do in loco parentis here. <laughs> They're on their own. <laughs> uh, and we do abide and don't take as a cliche Lee's dictum that every, we only have one rule and that every man is a gentleman. Uh, and I think that was also reflective of my experience at WNL, which was it taught, it was a real lesson in reality. Uh, and reality asserts itself continuously, and this comment about everybody you know, being nannied and living in a cocoon, et cetera, we did live in a cocoon. But there was also the cumulative experience here was an experience of dealing with things as they are. Uh, not, it, it certainly eliminated all of my naivete in the four years I was here. And I think it's very important that as you face and go out into the world, you recognize reality and don't try to perfume things or what we observe increasingly is an ideological distortion of reality. Because dealing with things as they are, recognizing things as they are, will enable you then to make the right decisions, whether it's in business or in personal life, of course leavened and overlaid by that code of honor that's been referred to and doing the right thing. Uh, so I leave you with that. Reality is important, recognizing it is important, and dealing with it is important. Thanks, Kaz. Yeah. Anyone else want to speak before lunch? <laughs> yes. Uh, we have been talking about the honor code and about the experience at Washington and Lee. I think George put it really well, and a gentleman back here about carrying that with us into the world, both personally and in business. And I, for the for our 2018 graduates. What occurred to me today listening to this was that you're going into the world armed with that honor code and with the experience of WNL. So it gives you an armor to deal with the world that many other people just don't have. You have the ability for honest dealings. You also have the ability because of that to make others more honest. I'm a total believer in self-fulfilling prophecies. If you trust someone to begin with because that's how you operate, the chances of them being trustworthy are increased immensely, which is just thinking today that's what the WNL experience gave us all, is that ability to trust and be trusted. One other just thought and is the concept of time. I started to write about this, Alex, but it was such a subject that I confused myself so I didn't go too much farther <laughs> <laughs> because the, the concept is that time is the most absolute commodity in the universe and at the same time the most relative commodity in the universe. When we think about time passing, 50 years has passed since we were here. And I think every one of us has the current experience of time passing faster every year relative to ourselves. And that's something that expands. The more you think about it, nothing we do escapes time. So all of you new graduates realize the preciousness of it and the vulnerability of time. Alex. Yeah. One follow up on Corbett's comment about civility. I think it's worth pointing out that Corbett and Susan Bryant have six daughters, five of whom went here. So they are, are actively spreading the civility <laughs> at the face of Washington and Lee. Definitely, definitely. Well, we're, uh, we're at the end of our time. I'm going to leave you with uh, a quote from a man I greatly admired. I was at Harvard for several 15 years, and the chaplain of Harvard was a man named Peter Gomes, uh, a black man, a, 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 a wonderfully erudite and smart man, and a man with a great sense of humor as well. 
And one of the profound things he said is what I want to leave you with now. He said, remember, it's not who you know. It's whom you know. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Ha, 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 ha.